Now let's go to Sydney where former Prime Minister Paul Keating is speaking at a forum discussing China. But the United States is turning its back on that, that balancing construct, that Atlantic opportunity, returning to a US or America first posture, dividing Europe while leaving the bigger game open to Xi Jinping and China. So where does all this leave Australia? Well, the answer is in the deep blue sea between two great powers, the United States and China. Despite all the talk about Indo-Pacific, India and Indian GDP will not rival that of China over the next 30 years. So Australia will be dealing or obliged to deal with, with but two great powers, the US and China, over the next 30 years. Currently, India's GDP sits at 2.1 trillion US dollars. China's GDP is 12 trillion, probably actually higher than that. So at least China's at least six times the GDP of India. And in the next 20 to 30 years, India is simply not going to catch up. I mean, you'll hear people in the Australian debate talk about Indo-Pacific, China's going, India's going to catch up. It's nonsense. The related matter is China's residual growth potential. In terms of urbanisation, the advanced countries are in the 80 to 90 per cent range. The United States is 82 per cent, Germany 77 per cent, France 80 per cent, Britain 83 per cent, Canada 81 per cent and Australia 90 per cent. Currently, China is at 60% urbanisation. China has at least 15% of its population yet to be accommodated in cities, leading to at least the basis of another 10 to 15 years of solid growth ahead of it. And as China is the world champion at infrastructure and city building, no other state will catch them, certainly not India. So in Australia, we'll be left to deal with just the two most muscular economic powers in the world, the United States and China. But unfortunately, the debate in Australia has markedly degenerated in respect of the preponderant Asian economic power, China. Two underlying propositions go to this degeneration. The unstated one that somehow the rise of China is illegitimate, that a state dragging 20% of humanity from poverty has ulterior motives and has to be strategically monitored. With no premium being placed on the human condition where 700 million people have been lifted from abject poverty, an event without precedent in world history. The second proposition, debated more openly, is that China is not a democracy. Well, God help us if we are limited or slated to deal only with democracies. That policy would without doubt have lost us the Second World War. For Europe had no chance of being liberated singularly from the West. Without Stalin and the Soviet Union, the Second World War would have gone to Hitler. 26 million Russians died defeating Nazism in the brutal battles across the Northern European plain. I don't think we cared at the time whether those poor devils in those battles had particularly regard to Jeffersonian democratic principles. I mean, we didn't have them sit a test before they put the uniform on. Survival and a bigger overarching strategy took precedence. It was policy realism and remarkably it succeeded. And let's not get too starry-eyed about so-called democracies. Germany was a constitutional democracy coming up to 1914. But those instincts didn't save the rest of us from the nationalist instincts of the Prussian, of the Prussian Junkers. But let me read what one of the coldest of the Cold War warriors, the big new Brzezinski, had to say on this topic with particular reference to China. He said, America should tacitly accept the reality of China's geopolitical preeminence on the mainland of Asia as well as China's ongoing emergence as a predominant Asian economic power. He went on to say, America's specific strategy should not try to contain China, but to engage it in a larger hub of cooperative relationships that by themselves also help shape the US-China relationship. Now, I don't think Brzezinski's under suspicion about not being a pro-US Cold War person. 
And then beyond Brzezinski, Henry Kissinger had this to say. China's political culture has deep roots and is suffused with its own distinctive philosophical concept of life, of hierarchy and authority, a Confucian China with modern characteristics. The idea that upon growth and wealth, China would, ipso facto, adopt a multi-party Western-style democratic structure was the idea of people ignorant of China's long history or the recent history of the Communist Party. When Du Xiaoping went with the traditionalists following Hu Yaobang's death and the Tiananmen demonstrations which followed that, he abandoned any within-party within party multi-party groupings or multi-party objectives which his former party secretary Hu Yaobang and the Premier Xiao Ziang were considering. OK, we'll leave that there for the moment. That was live from Sydney. Former Prime Minister Paul Keating talking there at a former about Australia-China relations, saying China will remain far ahead of India in terms of economic power and also lamenting the state of discussion in Australia around China generally.